This evening, let us drink the tea of Titans. Two words that could not convey any more of a gulf for separation, tea and Titan. The former exudes elegance, calm, and particularity, while the latter groans in tension and enervates universal and unbounded limits to cosmic power. Tea resides in the quiet, beautiful moments of tranquility and smallness, each moment an irreducible individual radiating its uniqueness. This existentiality of the gods cannot be reduced to a unifying force, since according to Proclus, what is primary are the henats, or the gods' existentialities, over and above being, which is where we derive our relatedness in the unifying realm of the cosmos. What this implies is that our own little individualities derive their ultimate source from things beyond our cosmos, beyond being itself. It is the supremacy of the small, something that requires an intimate and personal relation for it to be fully felt and experienced. Beyond the cosmos are the individualities, seemingly so small and inconsequential, yet beyond the all. In this way, sitting and drinking tea allows us to fully appreciate the gods as divine individualities, away from the monoliths that govern our modern globalism, cosmopolitanism, our monolithic ideologies, our notions of an all-encompassing divinity that consumes and absorbs all manifestation of the small, the unique, the beautiful. Let us coin a phrase and commit it to our memory as a reminder when things become too titanic and all too much to bear. Kalos kai mikros. Let us never forget the beautiful and the small. To speak of the primacy of the one without reference to the many is to paint the cosmos with the totalizing colors of human misery, the gray colors of totalitarianism. The cosmos is not a self-enclosed totality. It is only the writhings of a dying imagination that says it is so. Kalos kai mikros. To what form of alchemy must we then turn for reprieve from our titanic impulses and overwhelming strivings? To the particularity of tea, of course. Kakuzo Okakura's The Book of Tea reminds us of its meaning, and perhaps equally as important, the ability to sit with tea, which ultimately involves the ability to sit with our own selves. Quote, each preparation of the leaves has its individuality, its special affinity with water and heat, its hereditary memories to recall, its own methods of telling a story. The truly beautiful must be always in it. How much do we not suffer through the constant failure of society to recognize this simple and fundamental law of art and life? Okakura also says, quote, the heaven of modern humanity is indeed shattered in the cyclopean struggle for wealth and power. The world is groping in the shadow of egotism and vulgarity. Knowledge is bought through a bad conscience, benevolence practiced for the sake of utility. The radical opposition between Titans and tea may perhaps not be the entire story. For the minor acts of tea's creation involve a gathering of the plant at appropriate seasonal times, for instance, at the beginning of summer, drying it in the shade to remove all its moisture, then a reintroduction of fluid with a bubbling up of boiling water, and finally a waterfall cascade on a small scale, echoing the unending outpouring of the multitude of channels and fountains of life, Rhea, as her name suggests, meaning flux or flow, the titaness who embodies the process by which all these sources reach their principles or archai. This grandeur, this cosmic force, all located within the interaction between a single teapot and a single cup. 
As the Austrian writer Aldebert Stifter once wrote, quote, the force that makes the milk in the poor woman's pot swell and boil over is the same that thrusts the lava upward in the fire-spewing mountain and makes it flow down the mountain slopes. Kalos kai mikros, small and beautiful, is a notion that emerges outside the gigantic realm of the titans. Year after year, and month after month, we have explored the heady world of metaphysics, the universal motions, the cosmic flux. No doubt, the tea ceremony embodies these ideas as well. But let us get lost, if only momentarily, in the swirling golden-green liquid of the tea, or the shape-shifting images that dance in its steamy vapor. For this evening, we are drinking mountain tea, or shepherd's tea, or if you were a native Greek speaker, you'd be more familiar with the name Sideritis. It is grown extensively across the Mediterranean, however. But what is so special about this particular tea is that it grows along the slopes of the Othrus mountain range in central Greece, the home and fortress of the Titans, as described in Hesiod's account of the Titanomachy. Quote, for the Titan gods, and as many as sprang from Kronos, had long been fighting together in stubborn war with heart-grieving toil, the lordly Titans from high Othrus. But the gods, givers of good, whom rich-haired Rhea bore in union with Kronos from Olympus, so they, with bitter wrath, were fighting continually with one another at that time for ten full years, and the hard strife had no close or end for either side, and the issue of the war hung evenly balanced. The flowers and leaves of this herbal plant have ancestors that witness the primordial combat between Olympians and Titans. Locked in its genetic memory is a photographic impress of the confluence of powers that unite in hostile symmetry. Well before the days man stepped foot on the mountainside, and detected the traces of bloodthirsty wrath running through his very own veins. Furthermore, the greenish-yellow color of the tea can be found shimmering in the sun among the ophiolite rocks that cover the surface of the Othrus mountain range, ophiolite etymologically linking the Ophus, snake, with the lithos, which means stone, because of the snakeskin appearance of this rock formation. Perhaps, it is for sympathetic or correspondence reasons that the 2nd century BCE poet Nicander in his Theriaca, or having to do with poisonous animals, speaks of the mythological serpent called the Seps. Furthermore, the snow-capped crags of Othrus too bear deadly serpents. In hollow gully and rough crags and woodland scour where haunts the thirst-provoking Seps. These creatures, later recounted by the 13th century medieval theologian Thomas of Cantimpre, had the most potent and violent effects due to its poison. Quote, if it strikes someone, it consumes the flesh and the bones at the same time with its poison, as if the victim were seized by voracious flames. Thankfully, the only lick of heat we may perhaps experience this evening is an overly hot tea consumed all too hastily not the poisonous flaming tongue of a serpent. The glass of tea is precisely the mixing vessel into which is poured all the constituents of the soul, including identity, difference, the indivisible, and the divisible. These four principles creating a tetrad and forming the foundation of all existence under being. A real storm in a teacup, if I may say. The psychogenic mirror of cosmogenesis. Truly, kalos kai mikros, the beautiful and the small, for it is there that our origins and our salvation lie. Take care for now.